So, I'm asked to chair this session. Uh, Dwight Swanson, who normally chairs the seminars, uh, is away. Uh, so, I should give my name at least, since it might uh, appear on YouTube uh, eventually on the Wesley Center, new Wesley Center YouTube page. So, I'm Jordan Hammond, uh, director of the Manchester Wesley Research Center. And we're pleased today to have presentations from two. Uh, scholars who were visiting fellows of the Manchester Wesley Research Center uh, last summer, James Pedler and Priscilla uh, Pope Levison. Uh, and we'll have a presentation from James first from uh, Toronto and then uh, Priscilla from Dallas. So we've had uh, some technical difficulties with the normal way that we live stream, but uh, we're still uh, re recording and uh, hopefully it will be uh, up on the YouTube uh, page uh, eventually. So um, apologies to any of you who may listen to this later who uh, were hoping to follow the live stream. Uh, so James uh, will be presenting first uh, on his research and one of the exciting things about this seminar is um, both of the presentations are based on resources that are right here in Manchester, and so I think it's a good illustration of some of the possibilities for research that can be done here locally. Uh, so James will be presenting uh, first uh, and focusing on his research related to early primitive Methodism. Uh, James is uh, an assistant professor of Wesley Studies and Theology at Tyndale uh, Seminary, and he's the uh, chair of the uh, Wesley, uh, Wesley Study, has Wesley Studies chair there. Um, he's a theologian uh, who's worked in various uh, areas, um, particularly around the questions of unity, diversity, and division in the church, uh, and ecclesiological issues um, related to renew various renewal uh, movements. Uh, he's currently a uh, participant member of the Canadian Roman Catholic Evangelical uh, Dialogue. Um, I've got a copy of his uh, first book here, which uh, is a revision of his PhD thesis, uh, Division, Diversity, and Unity, a, the a Theology of Ecclesial Charisms. And I've got uh, Priscilla's latest book, which I'll pass around later too, but uh, I'll send that around in case you want to uh, have a look while uh, the presentation uh, is going on. So James, thank you very much for uh, getting up early and uh, giving us the, this uh, presentation. So uh, I believe it's 8 in uh, Toronto, where James is 12 here. One of the complications is that in North America, daylight savings has happened, but it's not happened here yet. So it's usually five hours, but it's four hours of difference. Uh, today, um, so hopefully that won't cause uh, too much confusion. Anyway, um, thank you, James. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. It's uh, wonderful to have this opportunity to, to share some of my work with you. I, I wish I could be there in in Manchester, but uh, here in Toronto this morning it's going to be 12 degrees Celsius and it's raining, so it's it could be Manchester. It's a very similar kind of day, um, and I'm really thankful the opportunity I had last summer to be there at the MWRC, accessing the resources without which I wouldn't have been able to do this work on uh, Q-Born because some of his manuscripts are only available at the Rylands Library. So you have a, a brief outline there of, my, of what I'm going to talk about in my paper, but I will, uh, I'll just begin. So the founding of the Primitive Methodist Connection is variously dated from 1807 to 1811. And this was early, you know, very early in a fractious period in British Methodist history. Soon after Wesley's death, uh, Wesleyan Methodism in Britain began to splinter, beginning with the Methodist New Connection in 1797. Small secessions such as the uh, so-called Kirkgate Screamers in 1805 in Leeds, and the Van Groom Methodists in Manchester in 1806. These were followed by the more significant revival schisms of the primitive Methodists and the Bible Christians 
in uh, 1815, and the short-lived Tent Methodist in 1822. Uh, and the carnage continued in the 1820s with the uh, infamous Leeds Organ case, which many people know about, led to the establishment of the Protestant Methodist connection, uh, which later emerged with the newly formed Wesleyan Association, which had emerged in opposition to the uh, Wesleyan Methodist Conference plan to establish a theological institution with Javis Bunting as its president. So the early 1830s uh, saw the emergence of the heterodox Armenian Methodist uh, connection in Derbyshire, most of which joined with the Wesleyan Methodist Association in 1837. But these successions were dwarfed numerically by the uh, many who left the Wesleyan Methodist connection in the 1850s following the infamous fly sheets controversy that raged from 1844 to 1849. Some of these eventually found their way into the Wesleyan Reform Union and others joined with the Wesleyan Methodist Association in order to form the United Methodist Free Churches in 1857. Now all of these schisms, of course, are limited to the Wesleyan family of churches in Britain. And we could go on to talk about the many more uh, divisions of Methodism in North America over issues of polity, slavery, and holiness revivalism. And the splintering of Wesleyanism uh, in the 19th century is so pervasive that it gets actually quite difficult to keep track of all these different groups, uh, particularly in my home country of Canada, because we inherited some of these divisions from the UK, and then we also inherited some of the divisions from the US, and then we added some of our own. Uh, and the fact that many of these merged later back into uh, United Methodist bodies, which sometimes took similar names to the earlier bodies, uh, makes it all the more confusing. So the chart I provided on the handout was Robert Curry's uh, attempt to visualize these developments in his 18, 1968 book, uh, Methodism Divided, uh, and this was limited, of course, to British uh, Methodism. So he provides this twofold typology of uh, Wesleyan division, categorizing the schisms as either constitutionalist secessions or revivalist offshoots. Uh, the secessions developed over a longer period of time, usually through a period of extended controversy. Uh, they were usually led by ministers and were composed mainly of Wesleyan membership, whereas the offshoots uh, were normally led by uh, lay persons, developed more quickly and attracted a more non Wesleyan membership. So, although they're not the first breakaway uh, Methodist body, nor were they even the first revivalistic offshoot. Uh, the primitive Methodists were the first revivalistic separation to result in a major rival Methodist body, uh, one that would eventually, by the time of reunion in 1932, be the second largest Methodist connection in Britain. So the primitive Methodists are an important case for understanding some of these tensions that are emerging in, in early 19th century Methodism. Now, the most obvious issues at stake in the separation of primitive Methodism uh, were methodological. It was the primitive Methodists who introduced American-style camp meetings in England in 1807, um, inspired by the uh, campaigns of the eccentric and itinerant Lorenzo Dow. The Wesleyan connection soon passed a motion banning camp meetings, and this became the flashpoint issue which resulted in the expulsion of some of the members and the establishment eventually of a separate primitive Methodist connection. But it's sometimes uh, suggested that theology was not at stake in this division or any of the divisions of uh, Methodism at this period. In a 1972 essay, Stuart Hughes points out that Curry's discussion of Methodist schism does not address any theological controversies prior to 1870. It's certainly true that there were no overt doctrinal differences between the primitive Methodist and Wesleyan Methodist connections, and no doctrinal controversy sparked the division. However, that's not to say that theology played no role. There were different understandings of the spirit and the church um, beneath the surface that occasioned this separation. That's what I want to talk about. It's well known that this was a time when Wesleyan Methodism was beginning to strengthen its uh, central authority and develop its doctrine of the, the pastoral office, striving for uh, social and political respectability at the same time. The separation of the Banter Methodists in 1806, right around the same time and in the same area of, of England, 
um, resulted in the publication of a Wesleyan Methodist pamphlet, which John Bomer has called the earliest exposition of the Wesleyan Methodist doctrine of the pastoral office. So the band group was a meeting place established by uh, layman John Brockers in North Street, Manchester. And it was, in fact, the center of a small network of such uh, meeting places that Brockers had established. Many Methodists were drawn to uh, emotional and revivalistic services that happened there, but they were carried out without the approval and oversight of the uh, circuit authorities. So tensions uh, simmered between uh, the Van Drew Methodists and the Wesleyan preachers under Superintendent uh, William Jenkins between 1803 and 1806. Uh, eventually the Van Drew Methodists defied a decision of the leaders meeting that declared that everyone had to meet for one covenant service at New Year's uh, 1806. And uh, this which was the flashpoint issue that resulted in them eventually separating and forming a Methodist independent church, one of the earliest uh, forms of independent Methodism. So meanwhile, the Wesleyan Methodists, in response to this, stressed the importance of maintaining discipline in order to guard the purity of the society. And they uh, objected to the Bandrew Methodist practice of admitting uh, non-society members to their meetings. So in that above-mentioned pamphlet, they wrote... And this is the Wesleyan Methodists responding to the Bandrew Methodists. We object to the plan of indiscriminate admission because it impedes the due administration of ecclesiastical discipline. This is an express ordinance of God as much as an ordinance as the preaching of the gospel or the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And whatever material interferes with its regular exercise is for that reason unscriptural and highly injurious to the souls of men and the interests of religion. Um, many have detected the influence of Jabez Bunting in this document, in this, in this clash, who was, he was a, a junior itinerant in the area at the time. So this emphasis on discipline emphasized by the Methodist itinerants and connectional leaders, you know, as bearers of pastoral authority, will develop along that same trajectory until the middle of the century. The primitive Methodists, on the other hand, uh, had a more grassroots and participatory understanding of the church, as I will show. Now, this is not to say that either the Wesleyan Methodists or the primitive Methodists had a well-developed ecclesiological perspective. It's well known that the Wesleyan family of churches has an ambiguous ecclesiological legacy and heritage, and it's certainly true at this early stage of Methodist history. Rather, their respective understandings of the church are coming through as they deal with these specific questions, particularly relating to ministry and authority. And as is often the case, theology is being worked out in response to practical and pastoral issues as they arise in the life of the church. So on now to Hugh Bourne. Hugh Bourne is the generally acknowledged to be the co-founder of the Primitive Methodist Connection along with William Clues. While Clues was the better preacher and the more charismatic leader, Bourne was the chief thinker and writer of early primitive Methodism. He wrote the first history of the movement in 1823, and he was the editor of the Connectional Magazine from 1818 to 1842, during which time he contributed much of the content himself. For this reason, Bourne is our primary source uh, for understanding for gaining an understanding of the theological perspective that was prevailing in primitive Methodism. Now, Born is not a systematic theologian, of course, by modern standards, but he did furnish the, this new movement which, with much of its first order theological discourse. If we consider theology in its broader sense as God talk or a discourse about God, then Born is certainly uh, writing a great deal of theology, and he had a profound influence on the outlook of early primitive Methodists. So we study some theologians because of their brilliance and profundity, and others, I think, are worthy of study because of their influence and significance historically. So in what follows, I want to discuss more uh, how he attempted to defend the primitive Methodists against the charge of schism first, and how this uh, sits in tension with his sort of quasi-independent revivalistic ministry while he was a Wesleyan Methodist. And I'll then show how his highly pneumatocentric theology 
produced a more participatory understanding of the church, which in turn contributed to the establishment of a separate uh, connection. <clears throat> Now, one of the tensions that's evident in uh, Bourne's thinking concerns his attitude towards uh, church division. He had fully embraced a very generous uh, interpretation of Wesley's Catholic spirit around the time of his conversion. Although he had little uh, education, he was a gracious reader. And in recounting the story of his conversion, he repeatedly emphasizes the importance of three sources on his thinking at this time. And the first was John Wesley's Sermon on the Trinity, which he encountered in a bound volume of Methodist writings. Now, this is not normally among the first rank of Wesley's sermons in terms of its influence. But Borden notes particularly that opening lines of the sermon, where Wesley uh, makes one of his contrasts between right opinion and true religion. So Borden encountered these ideas when he was attempting to decide which community he should join, and he was finding various reasons to object to every denomination he knew of. His main associations at this point had been Quaker and Methodist, and though he had some Church of England background in his childhood. But it was his reading of Wesley's sermon and the stories of the early Quakers that led him to believe that, quote, the religion of the heart was alike in all. And he concluded, I might join any religious society without undervaluing others and I might profit by all. Of course, interpreters of Wesley generally recognize his embrace of this certain degree of doctrinal or theological pluralism was balanced by firm and uh, clear boundaries on central issues of uh, classical orthodoxy and vital piety. There's also that important matter of Wesley's distinction between uh, doctrines and opinions which needs to be read very carefully in, in, its, in its context each time he uses it. Um, and of course, Bourne is not really aware of, of some of these subtleties and this balance. Uh, with his comment that he takes from Wesley's sermon, he basically he gives the impression that he's got a more latitudinarian view, that he could join any society, it didn't really matter. Um, and it's noteworthy that although he clearly reveres Wesley, um, this is the only specific idea he identifies as coming from Wesley at this uh, crucial time in his life. So, in spite of this generous spirit, which sort of relativizes divisions between Christians, Bourne was very keen to clear the primitive Methodist connection of any hint of the charge of schism. In fact, the entire first section of his History of the Primitive Methodists, written in 1823, could be read as a defense against the charge of schism. His primary argument here was that the emergence of the primitive Methodists was a providential one. It was one that he, and he, he bolsters his claim by uh, arguing that the formation of a separate connection was not planned out, but it was thrust upon them by the unfolding of events. So he says, the, the connection was begun in the order of divine providence and not in the wisdom of man, nor by the desire of man. He repeatedly emphasizes that there was no sheep stealing involved. They won new converts in areas where uh, that were not well served by the existing Wesleyan Methodist uh, societies and structures. And he also stresses that they made every effort to join their converts to the Wesleyan connection. He initially didn't even want to start a class meeting on his own, let alone uh, organize a separate society. He only did this after he was urged to do so uh, by the traveling preachers. Even after he is expelled from a Wesleyan membership in 1808, he does not form separate societies, uh, but aims to funnel converts into existing bodies until 1810, when the first separate society is formed at Stanley. And that uh, body, uh, again, they had attempted for months to join it to the Wesleyan Methodist Church, and it was only when there was some kind of breakdown and it looked like there was no hope of of the group joining the Wesleyan Methodists, that he felt compelled, he says, to take it on. He writes, he was struck with astonishment on being informed that they should be obliged to take wholly upon themselves the care of the Stanley Society. There was, however, no remedy. Uh, necessity was laid upon him. 
So at the time of his expulsion, he claimed that he and all of his revivalist colleagues wanted, all they wanted to do was use camp meetings to strengthen the Wesleyan connection. Camp meetings, born stress, were a new means of grace raised up by God for evangelization. And they were proven by the fruit which they produced. The Wesleyan connection was wrong to reject the camp meetings, which were the continuation of the Wesleyan heritage of preaching in the open air. In fact, Bourne and others argued that it was their peculiar duty as members of the old Methodist connection, which is what they started to call the Wesleyans, to promote camp meetings, which they believed upheld the, uh, quote, primitive ideals of Methodism. Thus, he concludes that the PMC leaders had clean hands when they started their new connection, having been placed in this position by the unfolding hand of Providence. And the new body was pure of the stain of schism. Again, reflecting on the formation of that first Stanley society, he writes, it was formed pure. No split out of any religious society, and no man who was a member of the Wesleyan society or any other religious society had a finger in it. We knew the Lord was employing us to fully form a, met, uh, to fully form a Methodist connection. Had I been aware of that, I had, I'm in the opinion that the terror of the Lord only could have caused me to go on with it, as was the case with the camp meeting cause. Um, and of course there's an ecclesiological assumption here that if you start something new, it's not a schism, which is a, a believer's church uh, assumption. And Wesley actually says something similar in his sermon on schism, sort of the approach he takes, that uh, a schism is only the split of an existing body. Um, but that is, that is the believer's church view, which you can go back to. John Owen basically makes the same argument a hundred years before Wesley and his dispute with Stillingfleet on that question. So in spite of all these protestations about uh, how the, the primitive Methodists did not result from schism, the truth is that Warren had been engaging in mission for a long time in a way that we made the Wesleyan connection and its structures more or less irrelevant. He became a key figure in, uh, in a local revival around Heresy Head not long after his conversion, and this continued for several years before the Primitive Methodist connection began to take shape. He may indeed have intended his revival to build up the Wesleyan Methodist connection, and there's no doubt some truth to his claims to that effect, but the relationship between his ministry and the Wesleyan connection had always been tenuous. While he was a trustee and class leader, he led cottage prayer meetings and even built a chapel on Heresy Head without license or direction from national leaders. He seemed to revel, in fact, in the freedom that he and his compatriots enjoyed from oversight at this stage. The initiative to host camp meetings was also undertaken without involvement of the Wesleyan leadership. And it's no wonder that this became the flashpoint issue, but it was simply the continuation of the way Bourne had been operating for several years. And to be fair, it was a pattern that the Wesleyan connection had allowed to continue for several years. As Tim Woolley has noted, the fact that the Wesleyans had been weakened in the area by the establishment of a new connection presence beginning in 1798 may have contributed to this. Further, before he was expelled, Bourne had carried out his own revival uh, prayer meetings in a variety of contexts, inside and outside the Wesleyan Connection. This included services with the Independent Methodists in Macclesfield, the Quaker Methodists at Warrington, the so-called Magic Methodists at Belmere Forest. He basically operated without regard for Wesleyan structures and authority. So the fact that his ministry as a revivalist was not well integrated with the, in the Wesleyan structures is illustrated by the fact that his ministry continues without a beat after his, without missing a beat after his expulsion from the Wesleyan Methodist in 1808. So there's a certain inconsistency here uh, in between his, his claim that he was not there was nothing schismatic going on and, and the way he was operating as a as an independent revivalist. But his actions make some sense when we consider his pneumatocentric theological perspective. I've already alluded to Bourne's life story and the story of his 
uh, conversion. And it's very interesting that, unlike John Wesley with his heartwarming experience in a religious society and many Methodist conversions which took place in, in class meetings, um, Warren's conversion happened while he was alone, reading John Fletcher in his father's house. Although he had attended various religious uh, services, he was not a member of any religious body when this happened. He also continually stresses that he learned something from the Wesleyan Methodists, but he didn't come to his salvation experience through their ministry and through the ministry of preachers. In narrating his conversion, he repeatedly emphasizes that he consulted no one but communicated directly with the Spirit, waiting for the manifestation of the Son. So as I noted above, Bourne consistently identifies three sources as influential on his thinking at the time of his conversion, the first being John Wesley's Sermon on the Trinity. The other two sources uh, that Bourne identified point, point in this more Donato-centric uh, direction. Fletcher's Letters uh, on the Spiritual Manifestation of the Son, and Early Quaker Writings. And in fact, the second and third influences come through much more clearly in Warren than uh, Wesley does. So the six letters uh, on the Spiritual Manifestation of the Son by John Fletcher are not among his most uh, well-known writings, but their enduring impact upon Warren is uh, seen in the fact that not only are they influential at this, his conversion in 1799, but in 1822 he publishes them in the Primitive Methodist magazine. And in fact, he publishes a lot of Fletcher uh, excerpts in the magazine, uh, whereas Wesley doesn't appear very often. Um, the six letters on the spiritual manifestation are not actual letters, it's a treatise written in the form of letters. Um, and it was written in, 18, in 1767, but uh, not published until 1791 as part of the posthumous pieces edited by Melville Horn. Patrick Strife has shown that the original context was a response to the reviews of Robert Sandeman, who, denied justifying, who defined justifying faith in terms of bare intellectual assent without any personal subjective element. So Fletcher sets out to show that the Son of God, for purposes worthy of his wisdom, manifests himself sooner or later to all his sincere followers in a spiritual manner. And he describes these manifestations as, quote, revelations of Christ to your soul, productive of the experimental knowledge of him and the present enjoyment of salvation. Now, like Wesley, Fletcher draws on the idea of the spiritual senses in uh, explaining this, faculties, which are, are to the spiritual world what our bodily external senses are with regard to the material world, and which, he argues, are only available to the regenerate. And he goes on in this treatise to consider several important questions related to the idea of spiritual sensation and spiritual manifestations, such as the relation between ordinary revelations that are necessary for salvation, and extraordinary examples given in special cases, and the differing degrees and intensities of these manifestations. His final two letters are devoted to an examination of the Old Testament and New Testament evidence for spiritual manifestation of the Son. Now, as I've already noted, the notion of spiritual sensation is present in Wesley himself, as are claims to the direct, immediate witness of the Spirit. However, Fletcher seems to treat the spiritual senses like a real set of faculties, uh, sometimes providing a description of how the manifestation might come to each particular sense, like the spiritual eye, the spiritual ear, or a spiritual feeling. Wesley, on the other hand, was a little more circumspect and used the language of spiritual sensation as an analogy to discuss something that was really beyond uh, explanation. He noted that these are uh, figurative expressions meant to describe the reality of new birth, the gift of faith, and the assurance of the witness of the Spirit. Furthermore, this language of manifestation uh, is not totally foreign to Wesley, but it's not his typical way of talking about the experience of the Spirit's work. And it leaves the door open to a wider variety of pneumatic formula, uh, phenomena. So, although the six letters on the spiritual manifestation are actually written before Fletcher develops his um, dispensational scheme, um, 
they do bear the marks, I would say, of a more pneumatocentric uh, perspective than we find in, in Wesley himself. Although, along with other 19th century Methodists, obviously, Warren does not see any tension between uh, Fletcher and Wesley, and his thought clearly bears the mark of this more Fletcherian uh, strain of Methodist theology. This can be seen in a number of uh, emphases in Warren's thought. First, he takes up this language of manifestation of the Son from Fletcher as his particular way of describing salvation. And this is seen most clearly in the way he recounts his first evangelistic appeal. He goes to visit his cousin, uh, Daniel Shuoff, on, on Christmas Day, 1800. And this is an event which he sees as the beginning of his revival ministry. And what he says is, quote, I pressed the manifestation on him, and it spread to others, and the new course of converting became great. Secondly, Born often refers to the baptism of the Spirit or the unction of the Holy One, uh, two key emphases of Fletcher. Um, he also tends to emphasize more the instantaneous work of the Spirit uh, in the present experience of present salvation. And in his later years, we find him frequently preaching on, on Pentecost. So overall, while Born only rarely takes up Fletcher's dispensational language, his theology bears, uh, reflects Fletcher's more pneumatocentric spiritual perspective. Now, Fletcher's influence is significant, but it's not surprising, given that Fletcher was very influential among all Methodists at this time. Um, what is more surprising is the Quaker influence on Bourne's thinking. Bourne doesn't specifically enumerate which Quaker writings he read, although he says he read accounts of the early Quaker uh, open-air preaching. And again, when he goes to make that first evangelistic convert, he says that he took along some Robert Barclay to read to, uh, to his cousin. And John Wilkinson suggests that this was very likely Barclay's most famous work, An Apology for the True Christian Divinity, which is generally recognized as this standard articulation of, of Quaker theology. Now, there's no way to know for sure if that is the case, but it's interesting that if you, you know, look to the opening pages of Barclay's Apology, one of the first things he does is talk about the immediate revelation of the Spirit in terms of a manifestation. Uh, he says, The testimony of the Spirit is that alone by which the true knowledge of God hath, be, hath being is and can only be revealed. By the revelation of the same Spirit, he hath manifested himself all along unto the sons of men, both patriarchs, prophets, and apostles, which revelations of God by the Spirit, whether by outward voices and appearances, dreams, or inward, inward objective manifestations in the heart, were of old the formal object of the faith and remaineth yet to be. So it's interesting, during his first evangelistic visit, we have him preaching about the gospel in terms of the spiritual manifestation of the Son, using Fletcher's concept, but also reading Barclay, possibly talking about you know, the spiritual manifestation. Uh, objective manifestations in the heart. So it's possible, again, it's a bit speculative, but uh, that Bourne is reading Fletcher's manifestation with Quaker uh, colored glasses. Not only does he read Quaker sources, but he spends a lot of time with the Quaker Methodists of Warrington. This body formed around 1796 when some disaffected Quakers joined a newly independent group of Methodists, resulting in a blend of Quaker and Methodist spirituality and practice. The Quaker Methodists would go on to become part of the independent Methodist tradition, with their leader Peter Phillips eventually recognized as the founding father of the independent Methodist denomination. As John Nolan explains it, the Quaker Methodists retained Methodist doctrine, class meetings, love feasts, preaching and hymn singing, but adopted Quaker speech and dress times of silent waiting upon God and eschewed sacraments. So Bourne frequently spent time in worship, in ministry, and in fellowship with the Quaker Methodists in the crucial period between 1807 and 1811. And the two groups might have actually merged uh, if not for the Quaker Methodist refusal to accept a paid ministry. So one indication of the Quaker flavor of Bourne's thinking is the great stock he puts in direct divine impressions of the Spirit. 
Now, while it's true that Methodists in general are known for taking dreams and visions and other extraordinary uh, moves of the Spirit seriously, these tendencies are magnified and individualized in Lorna in a way that reflects the radical Quaker emphasis on being led by the Spirit. For example, he sometimes notes in his journal that he spoke by impression on such and such an occasion. He sometimes made it in decisions about uh, where he was going to travel next on the basis of a divine impression. He also wrote approvingly of the Quaker-style meeting at Risley. He says, Here each one does what is right in his own eyes. They stand, sit, kneel, pray, exhort, etc., as they are moved. I was very fond of their way. One also finds some intriguing references to divine silence in Born. Um, it's also interesting to note that the, for the, some years, the early Primitive Methodist Conference was also known as the Annual Meeting. And that is a Quaker term, and Born might have picked it up from the independent Methodists who were influenced by the Quaker Methodists to take that term on rather than conference. But primarily, from the Quakers born, absorbs this idea that the Spirit speaks directly to each person uh, individually. Again, the difference between Born and other Wesleyan thinkers here is, is one of degree. Um, of course, Wesley affirms a direct witness of the Spirit, but this was balanced out by a more Christological focus, uh, not only for the witness of the Spirit, but also a strong emphasis on the means of grace as the way in which Christians would normally encounter the Spirit. So two further influences on Born's thinking are important for understanding this, his pneumatocentrism. One is Lorenzo Dow, whose shadow looms large in Born's uh, journal during the formative years of primitive Methodism. Born first encountered Dow when he preached at a revival service in Heresy Head in 1807, and it was at this meeting that Born uh, receives a, camplet, a, a, a tract on camp meetings that a defense of camp meetings, which pushes him and his compatriots along in their plans to have camp meetings later that summer. This was near the end of Dow's second visit to the UK. He had arrived in Liverpool in 1805, and he was quickly invited to stay with none other than Peter Phillips, uh, the Quaker Methodist, who we've just been talking about. So the home of Peter Phillips, the Quaker Methodist, was Dow's home base for that two years while he was in, in the UK. And Bourne uh, soon comes into close relationship with Phillips, and much of Dow's influence on Bourne is sort of um, mediated through the Phillips, who had all these stories of, of Dow from uh, living with him for two years. Of course, Dow is well known for his reliance on the direct leading of the Spirit through impressions of various kinds. He was Methodist, but he operated under a, a kind of freelance self superintendency. Um, which no doubt emboldened Born and other revivalists. But there was an individualistic understanding of the Spirit's work that supported this lack of regard for connectional authority. Again, Tim Woolley uh, notes this telling quote from Dow's journal, where Dow records his response to a question about what he would do if he was forbidden to preach by his presiding elder, Jesse Lee. And uh, Dow says, I told him, it did not belong to J.L. or any other man to say whether I should preach or not, for that was to be determined between God and my own soul. It only belonged to the Methodists to say whether I should preach in their connection, but as long as I feel so impressed, I shall travel and preach, God being my helper. This parallels with Bourne's frequent claims that he was led by the Spirit and consulted no man. Um, Dow uh, felt he was being directly led by the Spirit, but he had no sense that the Spirit might also work through you know, the decisions of, of church authorities. As Willie summarizes his perspective with respect to his discernment to the call to preach, he says, events which happened to him, such as illnesses and dreams, he interpreted as direct indications in the process of determination of his calling, but decisions of the wider church were not. So this becomes a very common pattern amongst Wesleyan revivalists throughout the 19th century. The other influence of note is James Crawford, local Methodist preacher in Delamere Forest and leader of the so-called Magic Methodists. 
Warren also came into contact with Crawford in, in mid-1807, and it was actually Crawford who introduced, introduced Warren to the uh, Quaker Methodists. The Magic Methodist moniker uh, was due to meetings held monthly in Crawford's home, where anyone was free to share, as led by the Spirit, and uh, trances and visions became common. Warren remained close with Crawford uh, for several years, and the two shared in ministry together prior to a falling out in 1812. During this time, Warren's journal is filled with accounts of unusual spiritual occurrences, which sometimes led him into very strange territory. In one well-known example, um, Warren places great stock in a recurring vision given to a woman named Hannah Mountford about a hierarchy of evangelists uh, pictured as trumpeters. In his journal, he repeatedly uh, notes this, journey, this vision occurring again and again, and he's keeping track of the order of the trumpeters. And of course, he himself is on the list and is, has his clothes and crop it, and Lorenzo Dow is usually up near the top. In other dreams, he meets Lorenzo Dow and he meets John Fletcher. Now, Warren's attention to these um, extravagant pneumatic phenomena, such as dreams and visions and other impressions, drops off a bit after 1811, when he breaks off with Magic Methodist leader James Crawford. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Nevertheless, the chastened pneumocentrism endures and pushes Warren and the other primitive Methodists in these grassroots participatory in egalitarian directions, even as the Wesleyan Methodist uh, connection is moving in more uh, centralized and hierarchical directions. <clears throat> so Warren writes in his journal on October 11, 1811, <clears throat> just after the first, uh, just after the formation of the Primitive Methodist uh, as, a, as a connection. <clears throat> I also see great cause of thankfulness to Almighty God that He has raised us up as a separate society. And while the preachers live who are at the head of our society, I fully believe we shall have no mastery. And this is most clearly seen in the way the primitive Methodists ensured equal lay representation in their governance structures. But it also comes through in some other ways. For example, um, <clears throat> Barn was very wary of long sermons. He highly valued prayer meetings and the ministry of what he called praying laborers even while preaching was taking place. And so there's this interesting set of comments he makes in 1897, uh, 1819 <clears throat> about camp meetings and some guidelines they issued in response to one particular location where the preaching was getting too long. And he calls this a great evil because um, not just, it's not just a pragmatic issue, though. It's, it's that um, because the preaching is going on so long, the praying laborers are, are being idle. And they're not participating. And so the, the issue is um, that the participation of the whole people of God is being impeded by the dominance of the preachers. Another way his grassroots vision of the church is, is evident in his preference for a variety of extraordinary means of grace, each of which was initiated and practiced by local lay people without the need for reliance on the Wesleyan traveling preachers. So Bourne claimed that he had pioneered several of these extraordinary means in his history, although you know, he didn't really, of course. Um, the first was a conversational style of evangelism, which he first practiced on his cousin Daniel Shubotham and then amongst colliers in Kids Grove. Second was <clears throat> the use of extended cottage prayer meetings, which formed the heart of his early revival ministry. Um, he did acknowledge that Wesleyans had been holding cottage prayer meetings, but he characterized these as talking meetings. And he said, our people aimed at what they called feeling the power. If they obtained that, they were satisfied. <clears throat> Third, his most well-known innovation, if it can be called that, is the English camp meeting, which, in addition to being planned out and carried out without the traveling preachers, engaged many people in, this, in these sort of companies of uh, praying laborers. And fourth, he believed he had pioneered the practice of following preaching with an extended prayer meeting service. So in all these ways, we see his preference for these extraordinary means of grace rather than the instituted means of grace, which uh, of regular public worship, the ministry of the word, uh, the Lord's Supper, and so on. So, 
in conclusion, uh, this bottom-up and pneumatocentric approach to uh, engage and empower ordinary Christians in effective ways, and that was one of the reasons why the Primitive Methodists did become a significant uh, Methodist body. But it left little room for the role of the church in relation to the orders of ministry and ecclesial oversight. This is quite clear in the way that Boren describes his own calling to preach, and there's echoes, I think, of Lorenzo Dow here. He provides a number of examples of direct impressions from the Spirit, which led him to conclude that he was called by God. He furthermore sees the conversion of sinners as clear divine proof that he has been called to preach. And he adds, as a particular point of emphasis, that the fact that this came from, from no man, but directly from God himself. As he recounted it in his later years, the moment he stood up and preached his first sermon, he had been raised up as a preacher. So the Spirit, in his mind, led him directly, and he seems to view the fact that this guidance came from no man as, as proof or confirmation that it's the Spirit's work. So it's not hard to see how someone who thinks this way about the Spirit's work will not leave much room for the Spirit to work through the community, particularly through structures of authority. <clears throat> now, Warren's own experience, no doubt, played a role in uh, supporting this perspective. You know, if you look at his story, he was converted alone rather than in the fellowship of believers. His ministry was started and carried on largely without the support and oversight of the Wesleyan Connection. And his ministry continued with little interruption after he was expelled from Wesleyan Methodism. Uh, though he claimed he had no intention of dividing the Wesleyan Methodist Church, he acted independently of the connection structures. He did not want to be blamed for introducing a schism, but in fact his theological perspective left him with little reason to resist separation in the face of conflict. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. We have uh, a little bit of time for any questions, comments, discussion from us. Thank you, James. Can you hear me? Yes. So I can. There's Steve Wright here. I'm a bit out of the camera. Oh, there I am. Hi, Steve. Um, yeah, thanks for your presentation. I was wondering if you could say a bit more about the nature of schism and you know this kind of new work thing, how the logic of that argument plays out. Because um, it obviously seems to be quite important in this case here. Um, how is it that a new work which takes you away from the current church structures is anything but schismatic? Good question. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I mean, it, it doesn't, in my mind, it doesn't really follow, but I think, you know, the idea is, and you see other people making the same claim. I mean, my, so my own research has been in, in Salvation Army, which is my background, and and they make exactly the same kind of claims. Uh, you know, we're just converting new converts. We're not splitting any church. But obviously it's clear that Born and all, a lot of the leaders from, from the Primitive Methodists did come from the Wesleyan Methodist connection themselves. And, um, and, they, and probably some of the members did as well, although they, they said they didn't. Um, but I think that the basic logic scripturally is, is to go back to, um, you know, okay, what was Paul addressing in 1 Corinthians and say, well, he wasn't talking about starting new churches, he was talking about splits within that fellowship. And so, I mean, actually, I think if you're really, if you're really restrict, you know, if you're really uh, biblicist in a way, you, you, can, you can see the logic there, what, what does the word schism mean in the Bible? And it's usually addressed to that kind of situation. So that's the that's the thinking that's behind it. Um, yeah. But it's not sort of it's not sort of laid out here. It's just sort of an assumption. Well, it's something new, therefore it's not a schism because uh, we're not taking Wesleyans. Although again, clearly the leaders were coming from that place. Yeah. I mean, they also said that 
all of the leaders were expelled, sort of on unju unjust causes, like uh, Warren. There was he was just sort of taken off the rolls of his class meeting, um, but it was seemed like it was sort of a backdoor way of of getting rid of him because of his camp meeting work. And then um, you know they, 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 he tells the story of, of him and, and his brother and a couple of other the key leaders, and in every case he's saying that they were unjustly expelled. And so that, I think, again, is part of his, his logic. We were kicked out mm -hmm. rather than, um, you know, leaving of our own accord. James, when you were talking at the end uh, about <coughs> how much of the language they bribe is very, and it's used by women um, in the 19th century in particular, that they were called by God, not by any human authority, and it makes sense because there were very few ecclesial bodies at that time that were giving credence to women preachers, and also um, the role of camp meetings, uh, particularly in the 19th century, are the very locales where women are finding, um, are, are exercising their preaching right. and the exhorting, and so, it, particularly in your ending, that could have been scripted by by many of the women that I've studied. It's just interesting. Well, okay. Yeah, I think, and I, and I should say, I mean, I don't, I, there's obviously, I think if you look at, you know, who's to blame in this whole situation, there's obviously problems on both sides. You have sort of exaggerated views of authority on one side and, and, and a disregard for any kind of authority on the other side, and, and um, and it's, it, you know, historically there's a lot of complications to do with what was going on politically and, and the association of camp meetings with America and Dow coming over and preaching Republican ideas. And so there were lots of reasons why the Wesleyan Methodists were, were, were trying to clamp down. Um, the primitive Methodists didn't really have any of that on their radar screen. They were just trying to be revivalists and, and they weren't trying to do anything political, but um, so I think they were maybe a bit naive about some of those those things. But yeah, I mean, I think it, I don't know, it's, it's, this is a, a classic question with these kind of situations. So many Protestant denominations didn't start as denominations. Uh, they start as some kind of renewal movement within a denomination and but for whatever reason, they are not accepted, or they are marginalized. And um, in the Protestant context, it's pretty easy to just start something new. Um, what's interesting is to contrast this with the, the Catholic Church and the emergence of religious orders and other kinds of associations within the church, that there's this way for them to spring up and sort of remain within the, the Catholic fold. Um, but Protestantism hasn't, you know, doesn't have that sort of structure, and so it usually, usually this is the pattern. James, you mentioned in your introduction that the Wesleyan Methodists at this time were developing a theology of ministry. Um, they were concerned about ordination and should we start ordaining our own preachers and those kind of questions. Uh, was born engaging in any of that in any way and thinking about ordination and uh, questions of minis ministry in, in those senses or was that just off the radar? Yeah, they, um, I'm not sure about the word ordination. I know they, they, um, they certainly have a very low functional view of ministry. Um, I know they, they did not accept the title reverend. Um, even Lauren himself, even in his later years, wanted to be called the Venerable Hugh Lauren. You know, um, so and, and when it comes to things like communion, in one of the early uh, minutes, the records of the minutes, they're they're discussing what to do about the Lord's Supper. You know, well, who who can receive communion? It's sort of like, well, everyone who wants it and. Who can administer it? Well, anyone we anyone we decide. So it's, it was like it wasn't like only ordained people, right? It was just whoever we decide is appropriate can administer. So I think that's sort of the the, the logic uh, that they were. 
but I, I'm not sure exactly when did they when did they start to use the language of ordination. That would be an interesting question. Um, and, and how did that theology develop, right? I mean, obviously by the end of the 19th century, they they have their own schools and and a much more professionalized ministry. But for Bourne, I think it was more, much more grassroots, and and probably mostly just about availability rather than um, special, you know, anything but the laying on of hands or anything like that. Um, gifts. I mean, he cites Wesley on the gifts, gifts, grace, and fruit, or grace, gifts, and fruit as a criteria, but um, he doesn't really talk about how that gets worked out in the in the structure. That I would call anyway. Yeah. And you mentioned um, you know, Bourne's concern to avoid um, being seen as a schismatic movement or denying there was a schismatic movement, and you see that comes along with intentionally calling themselves a connection, primitive Methodist connection. So it seems that that lived on for quite a long time. Uh, I believe it wasn't until late 19th century, maybe 1880, something like that, before they, the Primitive Methodist Connection starts using the word church, even, so that to continue for another generation or two. Right. That's very interesting. And again, parallel some other uh, similar revivalist denominations that resist that label of church or denomination. Mm 